У нас кондиционер жарко, кондиционер работает и очень даже поддувает. Dear friends, hello everybody. This is the third day of International Summer School on Data Science in Software Engineering. And uh, today we have three lectures. And the first lecture is on uh, is a, a lecture on artific artificial neural networks, applications and challenges. The speaker is Yevgeny Tsimbalov, senior algorithm engineer at uh, Huawei Moscow Research Center. Uh, Evgeny, hello. Hi. So, uh, let's begin. Uh, sure. Can you see the presentation? Hey, can I start? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's assume that everyone sees my presentation. So, hi everyone. Uh, as far as I said, I'm Eugene Zimbalov and I'm doing artificial neural networks, I guess, for like uh, six or seven years. And uh, in today's lecture, I would be talking about, you know, uh, from the point of view uh, uh, of the learners who know something about the machine learning, who maybe practice the machine learning, but they uh, weren't uh, like proficient in neural networks. So uh, I will be talking about like what neural networks are. Uh, I will be talking about the uh, like main part of neural networks, uh, like to understand uh, the capabilities of these models. I will be talking about uh, some practical aspects on how these uh, nice models could be trained and tweaked. And uh, the large part of lecture would be uh, devoted to the large overview of the various applications uh, separated by uh, like fields of study. Uh, and I will be talking for a few minutes about the challenges which poses neural networks uh, so today. So let's begin. If you have any questions, please uh, write them to chat and eventually I will see them and I will try to answer them. Okay, uh, so I have uh, a lot of slides, so let's, let's move on. Uh, so what the, like, let's start with the neural networks and deep learning. So actually, so when machine learning is a like uh, a field of study, which studies uh, you know some uh, models that uh, like pre that are solely based on data and predict some properties and uh, could uh, could could be used in various ways. So the deep learning is a subfield of machine learning which studies models which consist of many uh, like blocks. So it's not necessarily the neural networks, but now these are synonymic because of the nice capability of neural networks. So the deep learning is studies just you know large models which consist of large blocks. And uh, the main thing is that uh, in most of the cases, uh, these models, they are treated and trained as a whole. So you have some end-to-end -end model which uh, uh, takes something like uh, pictures so audio or maybe different sources of data as an input and produces some kind of output. And uh, in most of the cases, you don't uh, really uh, care what's going on inside, uh, at least from the, from the side of the end user. So a neural network is uh, this kind of model, but uh, which one? Uh, one that consists of specific uh, blocks and layers. So layer is actually a part of the block uh, of uh, certain types. And uh, the neural networks, they are usually uh, not only uh, treated, but uh, trained and used in the end-to-end -end fashion. So you uh, like the way, the way the neural network is used is uh, like, 90% of the time is the way it was trained on different subsets of data. So uh, maybe a few facts uh, like about neural networks, why they're great. Uh, so yeah, I, I shouldn't say that it's the most popular model for the complex problems. Uh, it was uh, more than 20 years ago, more than even 30 years ago when uh, like it was uh, shown theoretically that the neural networks they are universal approximators, so uh, they can approximate uh, like 
uh, basically uh, an arbitrary function uh like analytic function uh, given uh, like multiple layers and they have large capacity so uh like no matter how hard and complex function uh, underlying function is it could be approximated by neural network of the simplest type and yeah as i said before it consists of blocks and this uh, in turn consists of layers and we will be talking about this a bit later so it uh, so the typical structure of the neural network is you have some input as a layer and then you have a few uh you know blocks which uh transform the data like apply some parameters to data and do something and the last layer is actually an output and like these layers they just trained trained by gradient descent like algorithms so uh, you uh, in most of the cases you need to have a lot of data and i mean not really a lot of data uh to to train it uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, these neural networks, they are uh, widely available uh, in terms of uh, a lot of people they, uh, and corporations, they uh, pre-train large models and uh, make them open access. Uh, so one can like download the model and use this for himself, for herself, on, and it can be also fine-tuned. So you can uh, kind of uh, tailor your model to your specific task uh in order to like, solve your specific problem and uh, that's a very nice property uh, of the neural network so you can uh, like get a model already trained to for example to uh, separate cats from dogs and uh, train it to uh, if you have data to separate different breeds of cats for example uh yeah and they are usually very parallelizable by nature so uh, uh that means that they have a high throw output uh, capacity so uh, uh like you can uh, like uh, just uh, train it in a distributed fashion across uh, multiple servers across gpus and uh, it's also very nice to have because there are some models in machine learning which are uh, very good approximators but still have some problems in the side Okay, let's move on uh, to the layers and blocks. So we'll be talking about, you know, the most simple blocks beca uh, because there are, you know, a lot of variations of those. But we will be talking about like uh, three main uh, types. It's a fully connected blocks, it's a convolutional blocks, and recurrent blocks. And uh, maybe I will uh, say a few words about uh, different variations of those. So let's start with the fully connected layer uh like full connected layer is a uh, like simplest layer uh where it's all started so the thing is if you have uh, some uh, for example uh, input vector uh you can just multiply it by some matrix and not not, not by some matrix but uh, the matrix with a nice shape uh because uh, the multiplication should work yeah add some bias uh, take some non-linearity and voila you have as the next layer of the neural network so uh, if the hl is a previous layer of the neural network you can multiply it by matrix w which have a lot of parameters you have a bias which have like not so many parameters and you can take some nonlinearity. it could be some sigmoid function it could be some uh, like rectified linear unit function like you know something to make it not linear because if you take it just linear there will be no sense of making multiple linear layers uh, because it will be a multiple uh, linear operation so that's why you add this nonlinearity and uh, you just uh, compose it uh, like varying sizes and uh, have a fully connected neural network so you have vector is an input and some output it may be uh, like it depends on your problem it could be the class uh for example if you have 10 classes you predict in the digits for example you will have a vector of size 10 with the probabilities for each vector or if you just predict some for example stock price or something like that you can just uh like output the one value and uh, i will talk about the training later but the, the thing is it's just you know batch of matrix multiplications and non -realities. and uh it's uh, it's nice and already works but the big problem with that is that uh may be too expensive to have this large matrix multiplication uh, for large vectors uh like imagine you have some image for example you take like okay maybe it could be uh, like photo from your 
a camera which consists of millions of pixels and uh, you remember that each pixel consists of separate colors and this will result in a, a like vector uh, input vector of like um, like multi-million lens and uh, like if you want to multiply this matrix on a corresponding matrix uh, it would be like not nice at all because the matrix multiplication is uh, like uh, like quadratic to cubic and no it should it should be quadratic yeah so it's a quadratic multiplication and uh, it will just you know uh, slow things a lot and usually if you have some large input vectors uh, there are uh, different uh, there are actually like two main ways uh, how you can deal with them for uh, like in both ways they are um, like exploiting its internal structure and the first uh, very known way is to use a convolutional layer uh, so if you know that your input is an image uh, you know that images they have some intrinsic properties uh, you, which you can uh, like you know uh, take into account by working with them for example, you know that the pixels on image, they are like correlated to each other in, in terms of if they are close to each other, because uh, for example, if you take a photo, then the colors, they change smoothly and there will be like in most of the cases, no large uh, like, uh, you know, uh, changes uh, in the brightness or in the color. So you can exploit that uh, and uh, also like prior to the development of neural network there was a uh, like a large field of computer vision it, it, it also exists but now it's mo mostly connected with uh, neural networks on it because they are nice models and the thing is that uh, like they also used uh, approaches uh, which is based on uh, like uh, on a small uh, window of attention which goes through the image and this window is called filter or kernel and you just uh, like for example on the image we have here uh, like let's let's assume that we have this kind of image can you see my cursor uh, yes I guess you can uh, at least it should be so so if you have this uh, for example image of uh, zeros and ones I don't know why. So you can uh, just uh, use a three by three uh, kernel and go through the like, uh, just you know, traverse the this image uh, and multiply it by some kind of kernel, and you will have uh, like uh, this kind of cranker product. No, no, not cranker product. Okay, so it, it is some dark product, uh, and uh, you will have some value for the you know uh how it's called the feature map so you just multiply so if you have this kind of kernel you multiply it by this part of the image and it will result in a single number you put on the top left corner and uh, because you don't have the boundaries here the the like feature map will be uh, like smaller yeah it there are six by six here but there it will be just be four by four and you get just can fill it with numbers uh, using this way and you can train these kernel parameters and uh, this actually reduces uh, amount of parameters by a lot like by, by, like i mean uh, really a lot uh, so people also use not not a single kernel but multiple kernels uh, like for example you have this 10 kernels and you have 10 feature maps like uh, as you see on the picture before so for example you just have one image and here you used uh, four different kernels and it resulted in uh like if the kernel is nine by nine uh it will result on the smaller image but there will be four feature maps because you used four kernels and uh, then you can uh, do max pooling which is a uh, kind of analog of non-linearity but for the convolutions you just you know uh take some uh, uh, ma ma maximal values uh out of the kernel uh not out of the kernel out of the attention window and we have smaller resolution and they just you know uh, kind of uh, make turns like you have this convolution you have this max pooling you have evolution you have max pooling and finally you will have some uh you know they usually just concatenate all those vectors and flatten them so you uh, use a final layer uh, either as a prediction or to add some a couple of uh, fully connected layers uh, I talked about before uh, just to process the data. So, and that's convolutional neural network.
So the main thing is that it's just uh, uh, really, really how um, like uh, most of the people they know a C image because you know like there are biological studies on how we like have a attention window where, like we see picture as a whole, but we just uh, looking at some separate parts. Our focus is separated. And this drastically reduces the number of parameters and the amount of multiplication, and you can just you know work with images now. And uh, I was talking uh, with the images about the images as an example here, but the problem, not the problem, the, the thing is that you can use not only images but some other, uh, you know, uh, like multi-dimensional arrays or tensors. Uh, uh, not Soviet tensors, but you know, tensors in terms of multidimensional arrays. Uh, that, uh, for example, you can process uh, signals one dimensional, have this you know vector of convolution. You can use the images uh, like which have not three colors, but more colors because you can have like you know some infrared uh, channels. You can have some ultraviolet channels. Uh, you can uh, use another dimension, which is video. So, for example, you have these images which changes of time, and you can use a four-dimensional <clears throat> convolution just uh, to to like grasp something some things in time. And it also works. It, it also works, but it uh, like uh, works uh, not so good when you like uh, increase the dimension, but still works better than uh, you know just letting it in doing some fully connected convolutions. And uh, the, these convolutional layers, they also naturally generalize to graphs uh, because you just uh, like uh, work with the uh, nodes, neighbors, uh, like uh, as a part of the convolution kernel and basically do the same thing. Okay, okay, so let's move on. Uh, like uh, another uh, thing, uh, how to uh, beat the large dimensional vectors is uh, just uh not only do the convolution which uh kind of slide through the data but uh use the model which uh inputs and outputs and sometimes outputs the sequences so it just takes for example the uh text symbols the text one by one uh, until it reached the end so and uh, and this was actually specifically designed for text because if you do text uh, like uh, the traditional way, you will have uh, the uh, like you know special tokenization. You will have some uh, sp uh, like special uh, vector component for each word, and it may be not so nice uh, because you will have like vectors of ten thousands, uh, twenty thousands of zeros and ones if you use back of words. But the thing is that uh, you can just uh, process them one by one, uh, but you will need to uh, use a special type of layer which is called a recurrent layer, a recurrent unit. So it's basically uh, like in, in, in the most basic implementation, it's just uh, like called a recurrent on neural network and you have uh, just the same matrix which uh, multiplies by this vector and the hidden state and uh, do this again and again. So on on uh, on this uh, on this picture on the top, you have x, which is input, and you just multiply the same symbol, uh, the same matrix again and again. And on the each stage, it produces an output or something that sums and adds up to the output. Like it depends on the model really. Uh, yeah, and it predicts something. It may predict some, um, like in, in, in most of the cases, predict some sequences as well. So for example, you have this, like if you unwind that, uh, you have the xt minus one. So for example, uh, time and t minus one symbol, it's multiplied by some matrix and output some symbol, uh, not, not symbol, okay, some intrinsic value. And then it goes to other symbol, and some like internal information can be preserved in this way. And uh, as you can see, this uh, actually may uh, may be uh, different to train this model because this matrix should be like really very very nice. It shouldn't explode. It it, it shouldn't uh, have some large values. Uh, because it will would, will either output some random stuff or output the same stuff. And to fight those problems, uh, special blocks, which are better than one matrix were, were designed. For example, the LSTM block, which have some 
a special input uh, to forget previous output uh, to like adapt to the uh, to the hidden state so like here i just show the scheme of how it works but you you, you better like uh, for example uh, read it themselves because it's just um uh, like, like it's hard to explain in this small lecture, which is actually an overview of neural networks. And uh, so these models, they uh, uh, like uh, like used like everywhere for now. For example, like in all the generation tasks, you have some recurrent recurrent blocks or recurrent layers. They are usually complemented with the attention mechanism, uh, which make it work a bit faster and much much better. Uh, not 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 faster, but it trains better and outputs better. And and the sequences we predict they are usually not too long. So because it, it uh, that's why we had, don't have uh, some neural networks which uh, makes books, for example, because they are uh, most of the cases limited to some size. For example, the tweet size of seventy of one hundred forty symbols, or for like uh one page of the text but but, but not, not not too much because it will be just uh, a disaster this way but uh, different approaches to this, they exist at all okay so that's about the layers so it was a uh, three layers it was like fully connected layer which is multiplication it was convolutional layer which uh, mostly used for images and it was recurrent layer which generates symbols as given input so uh let's uh, talk about how to how these uh, guys are trained how they are regularized, uh, like uh, how to make it work, actually, like uh, from the technical perspective. Uh, yeah, I, I think I will not skip, but just uh, go fast through this part, uh, like to not dwell deep into technical details. Just uh, like, of course, if you have some machine learning algorithms that optimizes something, you have a last function. So last function, uh, you it's just a difference a kind of difference between the prediction of your model and the ground truth because if you train machine learning model most of the cases you have some uh like if it's supervised learning you have some labels for your data for example you have a lot of images and you have annotation like you have cats or dogs on here uh or different persons or you have to predict the income of people and you have this income in mind so it's just a, an, an objective which the model minimizes and uh yeah i think i think i'll skip the part about some uh, hard uh, loss functions but but they they are not uh, uh, in most of the cases they are not uh, neural network specific as uh, they may be applied to different kinds of machine models so it's a cross entropy for classification it's a mean squared error for like predicting the values uh and uh like but there are some uh, loss functions which are more specific to the like in uh, representations of neural network and stuff yeah i think we'll skip for now and uh one one bad thing about the neural networks is that they are so good in predicting stuff uh they are so powerful that they easily overfit to data if you have a lot of data uh so you uh, your model can just kind of kind of memorize it uh to uh, like just understand what's, what's going on and just like memorize all the answers and will uh, give some you know bias to your predictions and on the separate set uh of observations it can uh like perhaps not uh like um, perform so well and that's why we use regularization heavily uh, i think i should uh, uh, tell a couple of words here because like there are some regularization techniques uh which like uh like uh which are similar to the machine learning techniques uh used in other models so you can just uh, have the l1 or l2 weight regularization that means that your weights should be uh, like um, bounded by its norm not having too large or too small weights but uh, neural network also have some specific means uh, like one of the most popular i think the most popular regularization technique for neural network is dropout so if you have for example some fully connected layer you can just omit some neurons uh, just say that okay on this training iteration just don't use it and like it's kind of you know brain freeze neurons that's something like that and you just uh, like in this train iteration you just ignore them and uh, this uh, like uh, this structural damage to the neural network it uh, like uh, helps neural network uh, to regularize better so it uh, it works 
uh, it, it trains for a long time, but it works better on the unseen data. And of course, you can incorporate some noise into your input or into the weights, or you can just reduce the size of neural networks, or you can, uh, if, for example, if you're doing this neural networks with the images, you can uh, kind of change the image a bit, uh, but doing it in a way so, uh, the, so the answer persists. For example, if you have the image of the parrot, you can just uh, flip it or change the colors or change the contrast or just have some part of this image, but you still understand that there's a part on this picture and you can uh, do it like automatically. And this will also uh, increase the generalizing ability of your model neural network. Uh, okay, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take just, just, uh, just a few words about how it's trained. It's a stochastic gradient descent. So it's just, just uh, like uh, how, like how it it works on a very uh, like like easy, easy way. So you just have some weights of your neural network at time t, and you uh, because those neural networks they are fully differentiable. Uh, you can calculate the derivative of the last function, uh, like given the input and output, uh, with respect to any parameter, and you can change this parameter uh, like. Uh, on the way to be closer to minima, you just uh, making this first order optimization, and uh, like, uh, and you just uh, have the derivative of the last function on this parameter, and uh, just uh, go downhill uh, to minimize this loss function and change these parameters accordingly. So the, that's how gradient descent works, and stochastic means that when you have a lot of data, uh, you just calculate it in uh, small batches of data, uh, and it. It also increases the general yield a bit, but it's specifically the, the only way to train networks because you, when you have like um, like millions on hard or hundreds of millions of the input data, you cannot can like calculate uh, like everything at once or store everything at once. You just need to uh, update to update the weights uh, on the small batches, and you're doing this with sync. sync. And uh, I think that's it for the stochastic gradient descent. Uh, yeah, uh, this slide was stopping a bit. So uh, nice thing about neural networks that you can, uh, as, as I said before, you can uh, get a pre-trained neural network and train it uh, to your own. For for example, uh, if you have some, like uh, I, I have the example on the slide, if you have just some neural network, for example, which predicts whether this, uh, like uh, this, this cat or dog, uh, you can just uh, so uh, in the process of training, it may be like have have trained on a lots of various images and have uh, gathered uh, um, like a lot of knowledge. And for example, if you want to separate the cat breeds, you can uh, just take your neural network and freeze some weights. Uh, by freeze, you mean you just don't upgrade them. With the gradient descent, they uh, will be still the same. But uh, change some part in here. Uh, and to, for example, to predict the cat breed on a different task. But so, some part of the neural network will be the same. Some part will change. Or you can add something to the end end of the of your neural network. Uh, like there are like lots of different methods exist. And they like work just great. So you can. You can uh, just fine tune them uh, on your own, take pre-trained model, and there are a lot of pre-trained models in the, on the internet uh, to like uh, start your uh, project uh, with uh, like as, as small as a few hundreds of images or or maybe a few thousands of data uh, data samples you have. So that's, that's very nice property of the neural network. So we can just freeze its parts and fine tune it uh, to your own. Uh, another nice thing with neural network is you can uh, do the knowledge transfer. For example, if you want to uh, have a large model and want to use uh, some lightweight model uh, to predict, uh, for example, something. For example, in face recognition, you can have a large neural network which predicts the person's ID or for just, just for example, and you want this model to be smaller because you want to put it on the device or to make to work it faster on the higher uh, frames per second rate. You can just uh, pick a smaller neural network, uh, like which is called the student neural network, and just train it so it will output the same uh, classes or the same uh, output. Uh, it's the same uh, stuff as the teacher, the large pre-trained neural network. And it will also work this way. 
So you can just, it, it's not like knowledge transfer or distillation. You can just uh, re effectively reduce uh, the size. Uh, okay, not, not infinitely, but uh, to some nice amount. And you can do it without the, even training labels because you can, if you have a training teacher and you don't have access to the uh, original data it was trained on, but you have a lot of faces, you can, uh, without labels, you can just uh, have the smaller model to uh, train on it. Okay, okay, I think we, it's time to go to the applications. Uh, it's not much time left. Uh, I think I will try to skip some less important parts. Uh, I'll be talking about the three large fields and maybe uh, about some other applications I know as well. So the three large fields are computer vision, it's a natural language processing and reinforcement learning. So the computer vision is uh, like, I think is the most mature field in terms of uh, like uh, deep learning incorporation because it's just, it was changed like maybe uh, like eight, eight to six years ago. This field was just completely changed by the uh, neural networks and it will never come back uh, to its original state. So you have a lot of nice computer vision tasks at which neural networks, they excel all the other models, they excel humans and uh, can do some things you uh, can't even maybe believe. <laughs> so, okay, the, the simplest task is classification. For example, uh, if you have, if you have some images and you image and you know that there is a one object on these images and you know the like kinds of classes you have here. For example, if you have different animals and you know them in per chain, so you just predict the animal. Uh, you, you can see on the figure, it's just simple classification task. And uh, like a more complicated thing is uh, object, de object detection task, uh, when you actually uh, like solve two problems at once. So you uh, actually um, like, working on finding some objects, uh, like the bounding, uh, finding some neural network, it just found some objects, some bounding box for it. It's a just simple regression task. You just predict um, uh, two points, this one and this one, and you classify, and then you classify maybe with a different network or with the same network that it's a dog and you just find these uh, as many objects as possible uh, according to the, um, you know, uh, the, the train data you have. So it's called the object detection when you just uh, make these bound boxes with the classes. And the next thing is uh, the next level of complication. If complication is a segmentation, uh, when you predict not only the bounded boxes, but you can predict the fine uh, contours of the objects like, like pixel wise uh, to understand that this is a cat, this is a duckling or, or it's a duck. Okay, I think it's duckling still. Uh, and uh, this is a dog and uh, you you just need the exact contours and you will have a special neural, neural networks which also outputs the image. And this uh, segmentation is uh, like a heart of uh, lots of different algorithms, but one of the most promising results is for uh, medical informatics and healthcare, when you can have, for example, some X-ray images and predict if there's a tumor on it. Uh, if only the medical data is what's so available, but still it's nice. And uh, yeah, and there are some complicated tasks, for example, the face recognition, which uses both object detection and classification and uh, different, uh, like, you know, set of predicting the people. You can predict the people you hadn't base, or you can get, can even predict, uh, like, answer the question if these persons which uh, haven't been on the training set are the same person. So you have just, uh, like, uh, even solve this kind of task with the neural network. Yeah, and of course, one of the most uh, maybe popular, um, like, in terms of media popular um, uh, tasks uh, is uh, generation. Uh, it's a generation. So you just train a neural network to like basically generate some nice images of a given class, for example, from noise. So you have noise as an input and you generate some very nice things as an output. Like is here, you can see the examples like of the people who doesn't exist like they really doesn't exist, they've checked the training base. And uh, like those people were generated uh, like uh, from the neural network solely from noise. And if you have conditional generation, you can even tweak the noise uh, 
uh, you can even change uh, some properties, for example, make uh, this, uh, like men having more hair or different color of the eyes or yeah, changes gender, of course. <clears throat> and it's it, it's also a nice thing, uh, like because you, you can use these images not only to make deep fakes, as all we know, but uh, to use, for example, to uh, make more data for the training set or to understand what your uh, new dress will look like on you. And uh, it's it's a very interesting architecture they're using for it. Uh, you actually have two neural networks, at least two neural networks here. One that generates images from noise and the other sh that should discriminate the, the critic, uh, which discriminates the real world images from one. And the task for generator is to fool the discriminator and the task for discriminator is uh, not to be fooled. Yeah, it's uh, like, like it's hard. It's it's pretty much hard to train on a laptop, let's say. Uh, but if you have enough of resources, enough of data, and enough of trying uh, of time to uh, fine tune your model to train, because they are uh, have they are like hard to train because they can just not converge or just generate uh, simple images. So you you can do this. It's 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 it's, it's not hard and it's fantastic. I think. Yeah and. Like basically everywhere where you have some images, you can uh, like use this computer vision, uh, like uh, subtasks I've talked about, for example, in healthcare and security and retail and advertising, you can predict the emotions of the people like who work, uh, who are looking on your advertisement, like like just everywhere, like after auto automotive industry, like this self self driving cars and stuff. Yeah, but let's move on. Uh, yeah, uh, another large field which is uh, ex uh, basically transform it, uh, transform it not not a uh, big time ago and still transform it now. It's a uh, natural language processing, like the field which deals a lot of with text and other stuff. And uh, of course, the neural networks uh, in the past few years they uh, have revolutionized this field as well. So, uh, what kind of tasks uh, do neural networks excel at? Uh, compared to other models. So basically all of the task, uh, like this uh, simple task, which like is given the text as input, uh, predict the part of speech of the words, predict the sentiment or emotion uh, like uh, caused in the words, predict the intent, for example, like if you have this uh, interaction with a user, you can uh, even uh, given like some data, predict what a user like wants to ask you about. And it's, it's a nice thing for dialogue systems. You can predict uh, like the, for example, some rating and all the stuff. So it works this way. Uh, it, it works this way then, uh, that the neural network takes the text as input, like a pre-processed text, but whatever. And, and outputs uh, the so-called embeddings. So embedding is a, it's basically some vector which uh, which produces values uh, that uh, describe the like internal structure of this uh, like it, it may be a word it won't be a sentence it will be even paragraph and these embeddings they are uh, like you work on these embeddings or you just uh, for example uh, just pr predict this part of speech is based on embeddings and these embeddings they work this way that. Uh, uh, words with closer meanings or closing content as they are closer to each other in this embedding vector space or not. And uh, this and the modern language models, the like neural networks which work this way, they are uh, like they are like really, really uh, big ones trained and uh, like hell of a lot of data and rely heavily on these uh, recurrental uh, parts and attention mechanisms and train it to do everything at once. For example, predict the missing word, predict the intent and all this stuff. Yeah, it's about the classification tasks for NLP and the segmentation tasks there also as well. So uh, this neural network excel at finding some uh, like um, some special words which have special meanings. So it's also called sometimes name it entity recognition. If you're talking about the entities, uh, like for example, here is just uh, predicts the uh, like, uh, like for each word predicts whether it's some name it entity or not and uh, what to which class it belongs. It would be, it's, not, it's a nice thing to protest the text and protest these events or keywords here. And of course the text generation uh, here, 
Uh, yeah, sorry, we have this uh, Russian figure here. So it's text generation, it's like, uh, it may be unconditional generation. You can write poem, poems or like different text. You can summarize the text and you can uh, like, but the main thing uh, like for the generation, it's to be used with assistance. It turns like starts from the text assistance or voice assistance and to write an assistance. For example, if you're writing some text, the neural network can help you at choosing the best words or for you to work in the same style. And the nice thing I've seen, for example, is a coding assistance when you just uh, write here on this example, you have just this, uh, you just wrote the name of the function and the neural network trained on the whole GitLab, actually whole GitHub. It just predicts uh, what you actually wanted to write. So this is, it's a copilot project. So you just it just writes some parts of code for you. So it's it's it like for me like as a developer it will like really help a lot if you're uh, ba because you're basically uh, writing uh, more or less the, not the same things but similar things uh, during your lifetime. Okay. So uh, yeah, and and uh, natural language processing it's not only about the text; it's also about the voice. And we have we are like actually uh, seeing the transition right now because we have a lots of voice assistants and there are a lots of tasks like voice recognition, speech detection, and text to speech uh, detection of the sentiment or even diarization. For example, you have a meeting recording. Can you want to understand like uh, who said what and and there are a lot of specialized models which are you work both on the signals and on the text and also like just uh, like actually connected of uh, different parts I've talked about before for, for some some parts from this text text uh, like uh, a text working neural network and some parts from the signal working neural networks they trained all together to make it work yeah uh yeah i see i think i have to skip the reinforcement learning but basically uh, like just in a few words it's a thing when, like reinforcement learning it's uh, when you have a different uh perspective uh, on the machine learning problems you produce a series of actions based on the environment change and reward and uh like it's hard it's it's hard to train it's still developing but it's uh, already used in a lot of ways for example uh like uh, the neural network that predicts action and like do it uh, each it does it each time so they used like in robotics like uh, in, in gaming uh and it may be used in training as well to like not not only uh, just make a nice uh you know predictions of the price but uh do the nice the right actions to sell or buy for example yeah uh, ba basically uh, like basically uh, like everywhere neural networks they can be used uh, like starting from physical systems uh, up to pattern recognition data minimization compression recommendation like everywhere and yeah uh, my presentation uh, like contains the word challenges so i should say a lot uh, like a bit about the some like not open task but some like open problems which uh, stops the development of the field so like first first problem is that the neural networks they are data hungry and you need to uh, like uh, uh, have specific specific ways uh, uh specific ways on uh, how to how to train it with low data, like few short learning and stuff. So neural networks, they uh, can uh, produce gibberish. And in some cases, reliable, uh, like uh, for example, uh, so you, they cannot predict whether they are right or not. And there are special ways to attack this model. So you need to uh, put attention on how to defend your model against it. So make the reliable, reliable models and of course, fast training and fast inference. So how to um, train it faster to make it trainable on the laptops and how to fast an inference for the real time systems or work on the low power devices. These questions will also like always remain uh, like uh, always be on the top of your schedule and uh, two main questions which not uh, related uh, to the neural network but to machine learning as well they also challenges for neural networks it's a data and privacy for example uh, we don't uh, use uh, machine learning for the medical informatics and to help patients mostly because because this data is sensitive and uh, like no one uh, could 
or want to share this kind of sensitive data or we can sometimes you can backtrack the data from the model and uh, like maybe the one problem which I, I, I guess I addressed a bit today is a general education about what neural network can and cannot do, what the uh, limits of their capabilities, the, that they are not like walking robots who will uh, like slave the, uh, the humankind and uh, enslave the humankind. It's, like, it's, it's just, you know, uh, like pe people should be taught from school on, on, on how this works, on why this works, or like uh, to like work on this disillusion and uh, distinguishation of the neural networks. I think that's it. Uh, I think so in summary, I've just talked about uh, various uh, layers now of the neural networks, various parts, various application of it, uh, addressed some challenges, not addressed, yeah, but mentioned some challenges. And I would be happy to answer your questions right now. Uh, let's start from the first question from uh, MC Cirque 84. Could you say something on bio inspired non artificial neural networks? Uh, no, no, uh, I'm not an expert in this field. <laughs> I have a PhD in machine learning and not in the biology stuff. Uh, all, all I can say is that there are some, you know, uh, works uh, like uh, both theoretical on, on, on uh, like using this bio inspired uh, models or like uh, to work it nice in the machine learning, but it's mostly not about to make it better than the current algorithms. It's not in this way. It's more about uh, understanding how the neurons work, how the like brain work and stuff. Uh, this is not a topic of my lecture at all. Uh, I, I just, j just uh, so yeah, some people, they talk about neural networks and saying that uh, that the first neural network was biologically expired, uh, the perceptron. But like you know, right now, uh, like like uh, for at least ten years, is 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 not so. It's just you know some history, so, some history of the field, and not 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 uh, how you should approach these models as a practitioner. You shouldn't think about this biological expired stuff when you're doing the machine learning. I guess. <laughs> Uh, at, at, at least that's my opinion on this topic. Uh, what's the average system requirements for such calculations? Are they more effective when implementing on usual CPU and maybe GPU? Of course, uh, GPU implementations are more effective because uh, like they are just, you know, a uh, lot of frameworks to make it more efficiently, uh, like make work these layers more efficiently of the hardware. So make faster multiplication, faster parallelization. Uh, and uh, but uh, but all the modern laptops and by modern I mean all the models which are, for example, uh, which were uh, produced in the last five years. If 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 this is not low cost, uh, like one hundred dollar laptop, uh, it should be able to run uh, most of the neural networks. Uh, if you want to just uh, run the neural networks as a user. Um, uh, as a user, you just, uh, you know, uh, ha have just some nice, not yet, yeah, some basic laptop uh, can run the neural network smoothly. It wouldn't be so fast and it will be a pain to train them, for example, on lots of data or lots of tasks. But you, if you want to change, for example, your hairstyle with the neural network and do the other things, it's it's just completely doable on your laptop. And there are a lot of neural networks you can even run on your browser uh, to work with. So you can just Google it. So um, yeah. And about the implementation, they are actually implemented in such a way that uh, within the frameworks, which translates to the devices you need uh, so it may, they may translate, uh, for example, uh, the implementation on the CPU or GPU. But uh, like all the deep learning is now done on GPU. But if you are learning how to do deep learning, how to train neural networks, so you can do it with a usual laptop or use, uh, uh, as, as Dimitri said, uh, the open uh, source tools, for example, there is such a thing as a Google Collab, which gives you access to these GPUs or even TPUs, uh, uh, TPUs uh, to train on. And the problem is that they are limited by 24 hours, at, at least two years ago when I used it, uh, they were limited in time. Uh, one year ago I used it, it was limited in time, so you cannot run it for, uh, for, 
for a large time and the uh, results uh, wouldn't be saved. Uh, I, I mean, if you don't save them specifically, if the training, uh, like if you're not using resources and it's just uh, in idle, but the thing is that you can just uh, like still train it from the from the browser, like writing Python code in the Google Colab and train the neural networks. There are like a lot of like really, really a lot of resources uh, uh, with this Jupyter notebooks. Uh, uh, where you can just understand how this works. You will have this Jupyter notebook will, which will say that, oh, okay, this is a, a neural network where we import it. So it's a data, it's pre-processes, pre pre we start training, you can see the results, you can add your image to the result and all, all the stuff. There are like a lot of resources. I, I think it's just really Googleable, but but if some speakers need, uh, I can Google it for you. So if there is, uh, will be questions to uh, share the resources, I can do that. Plus LSTM. I've talked about LST, uh, LSTM a bit, but uh, I don't think I have enough time. So LSTM is basically, uh, it's a like recurrent uh, block. You, you, you can just, uh, LSTM uh, stands for long short term memory. And yeah, you can start uh, with uh, reading the Wikipedia article uh, on the topic, and uh, then, then, uh, and then just you know, just uh, like if you're already training machine learning models, you just import not the simple RNN cell but the LSTM cell, and see that it works much much better. For example, I had a task which involved the um, uh, generation of the cocktail names, like from from the noise. And the LSTM uh, worked uh, much better in this task. So I encourage you to use uh, this one. Uh, OK, if there are no other questions, uh, I think that's it. Maybe some organizers will help me out. Uh, thank you very much, Evgeny. Uh, ah, I see one more question. Just mm -hmm. ah, <laughs> so uh, it's your question. yes, ah, our, <laughs> our uh, audience, uh, thank you very much, and um, so have a nice day. <laughs> thank you, you too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, now we have a little break. Uh, just uh, seven minutes and then uh, we will return with a lecture machine learning in non-functional uh, in non-functional testing let's have a break
Hello. Uh, now let me introduce uh, the next speaker, Maxim Nikiforov, project manager uh, in Exact Pro. Uh, he has the lecture Machine Learning in Non Functional Testing. Now, Maxim, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear, but I don't. Uh, now I see. Yeah. You. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. So let's start. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Let's start. Uh, uh, again, my name is Maxim Nikiforov. I'm project manager in Exa Pro Systems. Uh, we um, uh, our team is responsible for non-functional testing in post trade and right now we are running a non-functional test project of a quite complex post trade system. Uh, besides of uh, regular QA work, besides of uh, automation, non-functional testing uh, usually is automated testing. We also um, uh, create some scripts and tools to uh, support our activities and to uh, be able to uh, do our work efficiently. Um, so um, this um, presentation and this project will be about uh, uh, the um, uh, idea of the tool that we started to develop uh, uh, last year during the data science course uh, in Exacro. And after it, we decided to continue uh, it in uh, uh, our project uh, because we uh, thought that it is promising and will help us to uh, do our work. So uh, in our, uh, in, in the next maybe 15, 15 minutes, uh, I will uh, describe briefly what uh, the Test, what, what the system we are testing, uh, the purpose and objective of uh, our uh, research. Uh, I will talk about the initial data preparation, the problems we could see during this uh, phase, uh, and describe what types of uh, um, data we prepare and the results of our modeling. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll share the results and uh, quickly describe the next steps, what we will do uh, further. Uh, so, uh, introduction. Let's talk about our um, target system. It's a post-trade system, it's a complex post-trade system. Um, it perform uh, clearance, settlement, risk uh, management processes, um, and uh, it contains of more than 350 components and um, 200 of them are active during the regular business day. Uh, and com components are deployed over 30 servers, it's distributed system. Uh, at the same time, it supports several uh, real-time messaging streams and uh, uh, more than 100 uh, different batch activities are executed simultaneously. Um, uh, at this point, I would like to define two very uh, important terms that I will use uh, later during my presentation. The first one is activity. Uh, our system uh, live uh, by the big schedule, uh, which is uh, determined the whole business day. Uh, and this schedule consists of a uh, small step and uh, one each step represents uh, some business job. And uh, these steps can be, we can call activities. On this slide, uh, on the diagram, we can see actually a timeline how uh, um, uh, real life uh, uh, business day looks like. Uh, each row of this uh, diagram is a uh, um, it is a one type of activity. Uh, you can see that uh, we have several lines in one row. It means that this activity is executed multiple times during the day. Uh, some activities are just once. 
um, we also have very uh, seldom events like weekly, monthly events, and uh, several types of activities can be executed uh, by operational team requests, so just for test purposes. Uh, we don't see them on a daily basis. Um, and you may notice here that uh, some of the activities can different duration. Uh, some of them are short, some of them are long. Uh, duration of some activities is depend on uh, transactional data volume, and probably there are other uh, circumstances that can affect uh, this duration. Uh, so uh, each of the activity is important because uh, uh, all of them are mandatory for the uh, business process. And if we have a delay, if one of the activities activity is delayed, uh, we will uh, delay um, whole process. And that's why it's uh, important to make sure that uh, all activities are completed in a predictable way. Uh, if we talk about the data, we can describe this activity in using five parameters, unique ID, activity type, uh, start time, end time, and status, completion status of the um, uh, activity or workflow or schedule event, in other words. Um, um, yeah. Uh, the next uh, term is um, statistical information logs. Uh, as, I have, as I have already mentioned, uh, system consists of a really big number of components and uh, uh, some information about uh, components internal states is broadcast by each component to one single process that is called uh, stat logs collector and stat logs collector saves them to uh, text files um, we have about uh, 30 gigabytes of such data daily uh, and uh, this is th this data contains process updates uh, most of process updates this information on um, every second um, so it's a huge amount of data, and uh, uh, we know that is useful for monitoring and for um, troubleshooting purposes. Uh, for example, we have a short list of uh, critical statistics. It's a parameters that um, it, that are monitored um, uh, um, on on a uh, daily basis, they are monitoring usually, and based on them, we can say if uh, everything is fine in the system, if we can see some deviation and parameter reach um, warning, uh, critical, fatal value, uh, we need to worry about it and uh, in start investigating what happens. Uh, but uh, this list of parameters is really short. Uh, we monitor them, uh, but uh, we still don't have enough visibility. And also, um, uh, and the rest of the parameters are not even documented. Um, one another problem with these statistical um, information logs that uh, the format of the of this data is not standardized. Uh, we have some common um, fields there, like timestamp, ID of the component, uh, group ID uh, of the parameters, but uh, the list of the parameters and data can uh, vary from component to component. Sometimes if component use, um, uses uh, different libraries, uh, log format can be very special for some of them. So, uh, in terms of um, monitoring, system doesn't provide a uh, uh, friendly way to monitor this data. We don't have any graphical representation. We don't uh, have uh, a way to view the history of updates. 
uh, we can just uh, see text values and that is all. Uh, but system provides uh, interface for any external monitoring structure. Uh, that is quite common for uh, for these types of system because they needs to be uh, implemented to uh, build uh, uh, build clients monitor infrastructure. Uh, so even for our test purposes, we had to create uh, our own monitoring uh, for uh, we, we, we monitor the duration of the workflow, the completion status. So for example, on the uh, right side of the screen, uh, you can see the way how we um, alarm about any deviations. If workflow is completed with error status, we can see uh, red color if, uh, if uh, one of the parameter, uh, critical parameters reach uh, some of the value, we uh, alarm about it. And of course, it's uh, monitored, uh, it, it's monitored in real time. Uh, but again, uh, sometimes it's too late to um, um, to see uh, the problem when uh, uh, critical statistics uh, deviated. Uh, it means that something happened and uh, something happened before, and uh, we would like to check if it's possible to uh, predict this uh, deviation or predict the failure uh, before it became obvious. And this is our main goal of this research. So uh, we would like to develop an automated approach for predict such deviations. Um, we will use the statistical log parameters for the analysis and uh, we also expect that we will be will be able to create a reliable approach um, our system is just um, uh, one system and there is a whole fa fa family of the platform uh, we uh, hope that uh, this uh, approach will be uh, adapted to other systems as well and ideally uh, the uh, deviation should be predicted and uh, indicated to, and to the root cause of this problem will be indicated to operational user if you talk about production or uh, if you talk about uh, any test environment, uh, it will be visible and uh, clear for QA. Uh, so, uh, let's start with uh, initial data preparation. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, raw uh, logs of the system are quite, um, they, they are not standard. So uh, we uh, need to standardize it in some way. We decided to create a converter that um, do this. And rather than having uh, text, uh, text files, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, create uh, CSV files that contain, uh, th that are actually much more efficient than uh, text uh, data. Um, and we will use uh, these pre-processed uh, data for any other query. And if QA or uh, researchers would like to get some information from this SSM, uh, statistical logs, we will be able to do this via some uh, framework that we will use. Um, we, we, we will use to gather this information. Uh, it will work for uh, statistical information. It will work for, for it will work for uh, workflow information. Uh, so this is uh, th this was our approach for pre-processing the data. If we talk about the converter uh, to CSV format, uh, the idea how we did it uh, is represented on this slide. Uh, we have each row of this um, uh, CSV format is a timestamp, and uh, each column is a parameter. Um, 
So right now it takes uh, about 15 minutes to convert daily amount of logs. It's uh, 30 gigabytes. And um, the, the, this uh, approach allow us to reduce, uh, uh, significantly reduce the size of logs. Uh, and uh, also the data is unified now. We will be able to, uh, we will be able to query it in some way. And uh, when uh, we uh, converted our first file, uh, CSV file, we realized how many parameters we have in the system. So it's about uh, 7.5K parameters. Um, it's a really wide uh, um, data set. And it's hardly, it, it's almost not possible to open it in, um, uh, and, and process it manually. So that's why uh, for our um, uh, research, we use Pandas and um, automated, um, automated approach. Uh, if you talk about the framework to access the data, uh, we created it. And um, uh, right now it's uh, quite uh, easy to get the data in Pandas data frame format. Uh, we just, uh, can I uh, use one? Um, we, we just need to execute one column to uh, get this uh, information. Uh, we can collect uh, information for a certain period of time, or we can collect information that is associated with, with certain uh, activity. Uh, and also, it's possible to uh, filter out unnecessary information on the uh, very initial stages uh, to be able to keep all of them in memory and get rid of unnecessary columns if we don't need to view them right now. Um, so at this stage, we can start our research. Uh, we can get the data. Um, uh, we decided to use to, to, to split our approach Sorry, to split our research into uh, stages. Uh, each stage is uh, linked to certain uh, data set type. Uh, the first one is uh, the, we call them activity-based data set. Each line of this data set represents uh, data that is related to one activity. Uh, and the data set two is a time-based data set. It is, um, each line of this data set is the timestamp and the uh, uh, rest of the column, columns contain aggregated uh, features and information from statistical logs parameters um, and uh, can contain um, uh, uh, information about several workflows at the same time. So the first uh, workflow type is more for just for, for research purposes because it's uh, quite it, it was quite straightforward in the very beginning to get this data to get this information uh, but um, it will not be uh, really uh, convenient to uh, uh, get information in the same uh, way uh, if you talk about any uh, real tool uh, real solution so uh, time based uh, data set will, will will be more convenient for this uh, task um, on this slide you can see the idea what information uh, is in both of the data set as i mentioned the um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, key of the first data set is a run ID. And we have aggregated information for interface logs, uh, activity parameters, uh, start time, end time, ID, status, and so on, and activity duration. Activity duration is our target feature that we want to predict. Uh, in the data set two, we have timestamp. Uh, the same aggregated parameters and uh, two types of information related to workflows, time since start for each of the activity. Uh, 
if activity starts at end time um, um, until activity is completed. So it's just basically number of seconds uh, before activity is uh, completed. Okay. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, our uh, data preparation pipeline. Uh, uh, as, have, as we have already mentioned, we right now we have easily collect the data from CSV files, um, and uh, this is actually the first problem that we got. The size of the data set is uh, the data set we got is really huge. So we have uh, two point five million rows. Uh, for one workflow, and the number of columns is 7.5k. Um, it, it, it's uh, two uh, big amounts to work with. So we decided to preprocess it to be able to, 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 to reduce uh, its size. So we uh, uh, wanted, of course, to reduce the length of the data, data set and the number of columns is also needs to be reduced. Um, uh, at the second step, uh, we have to uh, preprocess some uh, data in statistical logs. Um, we have um, uh, m m most of the parameters are counters like float values, integers, but we also have some IDs and um, um, some uh, parameters contain uh, unique statuses or IDs of some uh, other activities uh, that are unique. And uh, if we would like to um, preprocess them to use one hot encoding, for example, uh, each of the parameters will create its own column. This is not expected. And we had to uh, uh, reduce number of such columns. But anyway, after we apply uh, all this, uh, all, 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 all this like, preprocessing activities, the number of uh, columns is a, a bit, uh, becomes a bit higher. Uh, at this point, we are ready to prepare the data set one. Uh, to get it, uh, we use uh, uh, run ID as a key, and for each run ID, we uh, aggregate the, uh, the statistical logs parameters uh, into uh, using some aggregated functions. So uh, right now we have minimum, mean, and maximum um, values for each of the uh, original uh, statistical parameter. So uh, we basically, again, we, we, we get uh, three times wider uh, data frame after it. Uh, but after that, uh, we can uh, reduce it. Uh, we can uh, exclude constant columns because we uh, don't want to use them uh, in our uh, modeling training. And we can drop some correlated columns. So uh, at the step four, we can see that the uh, data frame became uh, uh, like five times uh, shorter, but uh, it is it it works well for just for certain workflows. If we work with uh, longer uh, activities, uh, the uh, effect will not so good here. So uh, at the end, we get uh, 2.3k columns uh, and uh, 11,000 of uh, launches, so, uh, which can be used for training, for initial training. And uh, we decided to start from very basic activity. We decided to check if it's possible to uh, train a model and to predict uh, duration of just one activity type. So uh, uh, we took one type of workflow. Uh, we use decision tree as a model and uh, as a metric, uh, we uh, use root mean squared error 
So in this case, it just indicates the difference between uh, value of uh, estimated uh, uh, estimated activity and the real duration of this activity. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's not really the performance not really good. Uh, we have uh, quite high uh, root mean squared error, uh, but the trend of this of, of, of these two lines is uh, more or less the same. Uh, blue line is real value, just it so it's just uh, separate runs, uh, and for to visualize this, uh, we just sorted uh, all of them by real value, and orange one is a model prediction. Uh, so we decided to try this approach for to uh, uh, on a full data set and to train one single model for all activities. Uh, again, we still use decision tree and uh, root mean squared error uh, as a matrix. Uh, mm, expect, it's expected that we got uh, a lower uh, performance. And in the next uh, several slides, uh, we would like to um, describe the problems we uh, found and the solutions that we uh, implemented to try to uh, resolve it. Um, so uh, we have, uh, in our data set, we have a different number of runs for different activities. On this plot, uh, we can see that some of the activities uh, have really low amount n n number of data points, and some of them, some of them can can can, can be really popular that uh, executed in the system uh, in real high frequency manner. Uh, this uh, and and we also noticed that the uh, bigger error we got for uh, the activities with. Uh, low amount of runs. So as a workaround here, we decided to uh, exclude this activity from the data set for now. Um, next thing is the uh, approach how we uh, split the data set for train and test purposes. Um, so we use a uh, scalar framework, and so initially we used uh, default train test split function. Uh, but we realized uh, that for um, um, that for data frame that contain all activities, we can't use it because uh, all activity all, all data points are not uh, equal anymore. We have different types of activities, and it is possible to get uh, the situation uh, where we have some activity type in train uh, um, or in, in, in train uh, data set and there is no um, such activity in test data set and vice versa so uh, uh, and we also if, if we check the uh, business process of the target system, we can also notice the distribution of the activities is constant for each day. We have high frequency activities, we have activities that just run once a day and so on. So uh, we changed our approach to make sure that uh, all activities are present in both sets with the uh, same distribution. And in this uh, diagram, on this plot, you can see uh, how it helped. Uh, red line is the regular train test split function. Uh, horizontal axis uh, uh, represents the activity type. Uh, blue line uh, is the like self-written function that uh, uh, provides train and test split with um, predicted ratio. Of the activities, um, so for uh, red line, we even don't see any 
uh, some of the activities, uh, but uh, blue line contains all of them and um, root mean squared error is uh, lower. So the performance of the uh, model is better. Uh, next problem. Um, we have different activity types again, and uh, the average duration for different type of activity is different. Um, uh, two problems here. We have to normalize target value. Uh, it will help uh, model to be uh, more precise. And uh, another question is how to how, how we measure uh, precision. So. Uh, the idea here that we can't use uh, absolute value in seconds because uh, uh, we, uh, we will definitely see uh, that uh, uh, longer activities will produce the bigger error, even the model has good performance for short activities. And again, if we uh, have error in 10 seconds, for example, or in a minute, uh, if workflow lasts for half an hour, it's not a big deal, it's not a big problem, but if uh, workflow lasts for several seconds, uh, we have a huge, huge error, huge mistake. So we decided to change our um, approach to calculate uh, RMSE, um, and uh, we get the uh, relative number of the uh, relative value. So, for example, if we get RMSE uh, that is uh, 0 0.3 uh, or 30%, it means that uh, we uh, we have an error of 30% from the expected value, and it doesn't matter uh, what uh, workflow we are taking. If, if, if it is longer or it is uh, short workflow and uh, uh, this is more reliable way to uh, explain and evaluate the performance of the model further uh, and on this uh, slide in the right uh, bottom corner uh, you can see the performance of how performance of the model changed when we switched uh, uh, target column from uh, absolute value to logarithmic value for the model before training. Um, okay, uh, another problem that uh, some of the workflows have uh, really big deviations. Um, and for such activities, we have uh, big uh, big value of RMSE. So we decided to, to limit this value by some, uh, some uh, standard value. So we took some 75 percentile and uh, it really helped to decrease uh, the uh, uh, value and to, to make system, to, to, to make our pro tool more precise. So the red line is right. Uh, it, uh, the RMSE for uh, limited uh, target value and the blue line is the original one. Um, okay, uh, here is the slide for comparison of the different model types. We compared uh, decision tree and random forest and uh, it's quite expected that uh, random forest performance is much better. So uh, for our production solution, we will use uh, random forest as a standard model. Um, at this slide, uh, uh, we would like to check finally, uh, can we predict, the main word is predict, the duration of the activity. So previously we used uh, data that was aggregated uh, from the very beginning of the uh, workflow to the end of the workflow. Um, here we prepared a set of uh, data sets um, that contain only just 
parts of uh, SSM data. So we calculate average duration for every activity and uh, created a data set that is available for the system for uh, the certain data point. So at 25% uh, time point. Uh, so we, uh, we, we collected a statistical data just for this period of time, but uh, we tried to predict, try to check if it's possible to predict whole duration of the workflow. And the same for 50% uh, and for 75%. And on this plot, you can see the results. Um, our expectation that uh, our expectation was that uh, that should be a dependency here. Uh, we expected to see that uh, the closer we are to the end, the more precise will be uh, prediction of uh, our activities of our duration of that activity. But um, actually, uh, uh, results doesn't show it. And uh, prediction is more or less uh, the same. There is no uh, uh, difference in there. Uh, so after that, we decided to uh, combine all the data sets in one and um, add special marker at what point we collected the data. And uh, it, it, it is the same flow that we had in the previous slides, but uh, we just add the red line. Red line is uh, the result of the model that was trained on this joint uh, data set. Uh, we can see that performance is much, much better. So, and uh, um, uh, we suppose that this is a good approach to be able to increase amount of data points and hence increase the performance if there are no uh, not, not enough uh, not enough data to uh, get, uh, get 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 uh, expected result from the workflow so if uh, we, we don't have enough points we can artificially multiply them uh, uh, using uh, in, in such way, and uh, the number of data points will be better, so uh, prediction uh, will be also better. Uh, and the slide here is about the um, um, way how um, uh, our, uh, our tool will be executed in real life. So for example, if you talk about production, uh, we don't expect uh, many deviations. Most of the activities will be will, will completed in predictable time. Uh, but uh, we do want to understand if our uh, model will react uh, if something wrong happens in the system. So we expect to see some um, uh, duration uh, in our prediction uh, when uh, something wrong happens. But uh, so to do to do this, we split our data sets in two parts. The first part uh, we can uh, we can call it uh, uh, good uh, good runs, and the second part is the bad runs. Uh, bad run means that. Uh, duration of the workflow is is deviated from the normal one and uh, we can just it's another word for outliers so we train the the model on a successful run of the good runs and try to check if it's possible to predict bad runs um expectedly uh, rmsc for this uh, test uh, set is also not good, but uh, there were more in fact for us that um, uh, it is that um, uh, we don't see any deviation from the prediction, uh, even if the uh, even, even if we try to predict the uh, deviated workflow, and this is a problem. Um, 
it means that we uh, we have to sort out and uh, in production runs we might have to um, uh, collect the deviated workflows to make sure that system and our uh, model is able to predict them. Um, and uh, on this slide, uh, we can describe the approach that we uh, would like to implement of our solution. Uh, if, if we want to do this for uh, post-trade system, we have lots of time overnight to uh, collect uh, data, process it, and uh, uh, train our model to make sure that the latest results from the previous day will be also counted. So we uh, can collect logs and the daily, uh, uh, daily activities data at the end of day of the system. Check if data is enough for all of the workflow. If no, we have a way to multiply it. Uh, and uh, pre-process and train, uh, pre-process data and train uh, model. So uh, once it is done, uh, during the business hours, we can use uh, this data to be able to predict uh, uh, activity duration. So, and the next day, the uh, same overnight activities are applied again. Um, so, uh, results and next steps. Uh, we created a workflow to access uh, the statistical log data, and uh, it was really useful for our research. It's very important to get uh, data quickly so you don't uh, spend lots of time uh, on uh, collecting it. Uh, and also this uh, framework is also useful for a regular QA task. Uh, we uh, use it and we develop it. Um, so we checked uh, and applied different approaches uh, and models to increase quality of uh, the training for data set uh, one. But uh, performance is still not really good, it's not stable, and we think that there is a lot of uh, room for improvement. Um, uh, we actually prepare the time-based data set, but we didn't have time to look closer into it and to check uh, how it works. And we started to do a proof of concept of the tool that allowed to monitor target system in real time. Um, we, we checked that it's possible to collect data in real time. Uh, and there is a, a room to here to uh, add a model. And I don't, I don't think that performance of the model will significantly uh, uh, change the approach. Uh, we can just uh, make prediction a bit uh, uh, rarely. Um, okay, and the next steps. Um, we still haven't checked if uh, altering the aggregation functions will help to improve, um, in, in improve the performance of uh, the model. Uh, we still want to uh, check it, and hopefully we will be able to uh, get better results. Uh, we wanted to understand uh, how much time we need to wait until we start to get acceptable predictions in production runs. Um, and uh, obviously we need to complete uh, POC of the product and check if it is uh, work fine will be useful in daily activities, so it's the main goal of our project. And uh, if it is done, uh, the statistical logs is a huge data set. We even don't understand. Um, we, uh, uh, we we don't understand all, all of the patterns that we have there. 
and uh, we suppose that uh, it can be useful source of information for lots of uh, regular activities and uh, if we talk about the uh, uh, further steps for uh, this um, uh, this project, uh, we can try to predict uh, failures of the activities. Um, I suppose it also will be useful uh, in real life and on a daily basis. So uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention and please ask uh, the questions if there are any. Maxim, thank you very much. Uh, please ask your questions. You're welcome. Not you, but audience. I don't see uh, questions now. Mm -hmm. We have one question. What else areas uh, your approach is applicable to? Uh, if you talk about the data pre-processing, I think um, it's just pre-processing of uh, values and uh, a common format of text logs. Uh, I believe it can be used uh, anywhere. Um, but uh, right now it's hard to say uh, what uh, types of uh, what 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 the goal can be uh, reached uh, can be reached here because uh, as I mentioned there are. Lots of different columns. It's not documented. Um, um, we can use just a regular data data set, so we can uh, dig into this data and uh, check if uh, we can uh, uh, identify some patterns using these uh, logs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, now we ha we will have a break. Um, and uh, Maxim, uh, thank you for your very interesting lecture. I I guess we will see you again. Uh, okay. somewhere, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> on conference. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for mm -hmm. attention. Bye bye. So see you in six minutes. Uh, and we will have a lecture. Uh, Meta heuristic algorithms, open challenges in engineering.
Um, hello? No, um, let's continue. Uh, now we have a lecture on meta heuristic algorithms, open challenges in engineering. And the speaker is Diego Alberto Aliba Navarro, professor of University of Guadalajara, Mexico, and also Tom's Polytechnic University. So Diego, nice to see you. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, I can. So are you ready to start? Yes, I'm ready. OK. Uh, OK. Hello to everyone. Uh, well, here is morning. I think you have a afternoon, evening starting in Tomsk. It's a pleasure to start here, to stay here uh, with this uh, summer school. And I'm going to talk about uh, metaheuristics algorithms, open challenges in engineering. Um, this is an introductory talk about what are metaheuristics and uh, how they can be used in different uh, applications. And also we are going to see the open challenges. This is the outline. First of all, we are going to define optimization and after that, we are going to talk about optimization in our life because uh, sometimes we think that these um, kind of methodologies are not present in our in our daily life, but they are inside of on, 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 on for in our lives. Uh, after that, we are going to discuss some uh, optimization algorithms. Then we are going to talk about meta heuristics. We are going to classify the meta heuristics. We're going to see some applications, the open challenges, and some time to discuss your questions. Well, we're going to start defining optimization. Optimization is part of the mathematics and then is uh, extracted from mathematics to computer sciences. In mathematics, we can find optimization um, as a task to find the best solution of a problem. Here, in well, in mathematics, it's necessary to, to minimize or maximize uh, a function, a mathematical function. In, <coughs> sorry, in real life and in our pro common problems, we're trying always to find different solutions to specific situations. We're going to see these kind of situations in the next slides, but we take this concept. We need to select a solution from a different choice, from different options. And the best of them is the optimal uh, approach that we have. So this is optimization for, for us. So this concept, we can take it and uh, apply to solve different uh, problems in engineering, in computer science, or in different fields of application. OK? So let's continue. Okay, but what is optimization in our life? Well, we're always take, um, thinking on how we can reduce different aspects in our, or, or maximize different aspects in our life. For example, we have here, um, 
when we want to reduce the time required for complete some task, uh, when they're going to buy different products, and we always expect to have the best products by spending the less amount of money. We also have the, uh, uh, an example where we want to visit different places in the same in the same trip, but we want to visit to visit most of most of them in the same trip. So here we need to find the best road that permits us to find to visit uh, such places. Uh, we have another example where we're going to package things with different size and um, weight in a reduced space. Here we can see this gear with the luggage, and we want to put everything inside, but we have a restriction uh, regarding the weight and the, and the space. So here we're trying to, to optimize, selecting only the best configuration of uh, clothes or things that they can fit and uh, the, the luggage, and also that are useful for our trip. We have another example here when we are going to buy more products with a reduced budget. Here we're optimizing time, money, we're planning routes, and also we're optimizing the, spy, the space of uh, in, in the luggage. So all of them are examples of how uh, metaurist, metaurist, well, hope optimization is present on our day life, but there are another bunch of examples that we can, we will have find. Uh, here is important to mention that this process of, in our brain occur, uh, occur automatically, and we select all the solutions in uh, according to different criteria that we have intrinsic in our in our brain. But computers are not able to solve these problems automatically. We need to program the restriction. We need to program the operators to select or to pick some products, some um, clothes, and, or assign the amount of time to solve the task. So here is when we need to extract our knowledge and pass to different methodologies in computer. In, in computer. But well, let's go to see some examples of optimization in industry. Here we have uh, four examples on different areas. We could see that optimization is used to for scheduling, uh, to given a flight uh, schedule, so to give aircraft assignments, or some restrictions that are necessary to uh, on duty periods. We also have that optimization is used in uh, in agriculture. Here we have a, the, an example regarding to the um, to optimize the nutritional requirements for um, for feed animals by reducing the total cost of the of the food. We have also an example related to gas contract purchase. Here uh, we can use optimization to forecast uh, the demand of gas and also see how much gas we are going to require for a specific period of time regarding the previous events that we have. Okay, also we can see a, a, an example related to transportation. Actually, optimization is very used in transportation systems because we could find not only the best, um, the best uh, routes, but also we could identify the best way to provide resources in, in a company. Okay, from the warehouse to the final production. All the process in, in, an, in an industry would could be optimized by using different methodologies. But for now, we we know, or we, we define how metabolism is affecting the life and not only of a person, but also for a company or in different fields of uh, industry. But now we need to see how an optimization problem is defined. Mathematically speaking, we have a function that is defined by, by <clears throat> sorry, by this line, when we have different global with different maximal points like here and like here, like here, like here, all these small points are the uh, local um, the, glo the local solutions, but between all of them we have the global maximum value that is the uh, value that we are going to find out, we are going to expect to find by using different methods. 
This is a global solution. And in optimization, we have that um, global optimization is one of the fields of a study when we're looking for this kind of points. If we're looking for all the points, we're talking about other branch of optimization. But here we're going to focus on global optimization where we're going to find this kind of solutions. We also have the definition of the search space that is between the bounds, usually here is zero to the other, uh, or this is lower value than in the next. We have also the neighborhood of a solution that is a space where we could find a different solution with a similar, a similar values and uh, while well, the place where the global maximum is located. This could also be extended to a multiple dimensions. Here we have an, an example of uh, a three-dimensional space. Again, we have the bounds of the search space in the axis X and the axis Y. And we have the function defined in the zeta axis, set axis, sorry. Um, we have again different um, points that are the global optimal and the local solutions. We also here include a current candidate, candidate solution that is going to move around the space to trying to search for the global optimal value. But the solution, depending on the operators that we use to move it, could be stuck in suboptimal solutions, not only suboptimal, suboptimal local points, but also uh, minimal points that in a maximization problem affects the performance of the algorithm or the methodology that we are going to use to find this global solution. So to, to perform this search, we need to define methodologies to that permit us to explore the search spaces. Here, we're going to go back, here the spaces are um, bounded between in, in a small range, but in real optimization problems, we have more dimensions and more, and, and the research space are, are, are huger than here. So we need to define good uh, methodologies that permit us to find the global solution in a reduced amount of time and using less computational resources. Uh, we, <clears throat> we here have three dif different um, optimization techniques that include the linear optimization, linear programming, quadratic programming, convex optimization, interim point methods, transition methods, uh, some uh, use of the gradient methods. And here in bold phase, we have evolutionary approaches. I'm going to underline this, that are evolutionary approaches heuristics and meta-heuristics. All of them are very important because are the methods that we're going to discuss in the rest of the slides. However, we need first to define a classification of these methodologies. Here I did a, a classification in two, <clears throat> two big groups that comprise the mathematics, mathematical-based algorithms and the artificial intelligence algorithms. In the mathematic-based approaches, we have the exact methodologies that is a subgroup of uh, the mathematics, and we can include <clears throat> all these methods that we have here, okay? And <clears throat> sorry for the um, artificial intelligence-based approaches, we have heuristic methods, and we have this definition that include evolutionary algorithm, heuristic, meta -heuristic, and hybrid approaches. We're going to discuss uh, some of them because we're going to see that they are also, they can also be classified in different groups, okay? So let's continue. We're here, we have another classification where we can see that we, at the top, we have the problem that is global optimization. And in this branch, we, in this branch, we have the other mathematical approaches. And in the other branch that is not um, rounded, we have all the approximated methodologies that it, it could also be a, a good um, definition, exact method and approximate method because, <coughs> sorry, in mathematics, 
where I was looking for the best solution and the exact solution. And in global optimization, sorry, in approximate methods, we are looking for the approximate solutions that are not the, um, the best one, but are close to the best, okay? So such methods are going to find the optimal solution when we are not looking for the exact solution. And here we have heuristic approaches uh, with uh, um, deterministic features that are the deterministic methodologies. And we have the stochastic or probabilistic methodologies that are more, most, more useful or in the related literature, we have single solution and population-based approaches. Actually, population-based approaches are more, more used than the single solution because here we have a set of uh, candidate solutions that are exploring the, the space at the same time. And here we have two definitions with a swarm intelligence <clears throat> and evolutionary algorithms that are part, both of them are part of the meta heuristics approaches. <clears throat> so we can, we, at, at this point we can ask us why heuristic approaches are becoming more popular. <clears throat> Sorry. The answer is because uh, <clears throat> exact methods that are, since they are mathematical approaches, are more complicated to understand, more complicated to define, and some of them require more computational resources. It means that to compute some gradient, we need to use more computational approaches, sorry, resources to compute these values. And this is necessary in different mathematical or exact methodologies because it's the only way that we could follow a clue about optimization, about to reduce or increase the function values. Uh, moreover, here we have that exact methods are not flexible to be adapted to complex optimization problems that are part of the real world. On the other hand, we have that heuristic-based approaches, including meta-heuristics, are more flexible because most of them does, don't require the use of uh, complex uh, operators that require gradient or other mathematical things. And then they could be uh, extended and applied to different problems by doing just small modifications. This is why most of the researchers, in, especially in computer science, are moving to the heuristic or the approximate or approximated methodologies. Well, but here we could ask us also what are the difference between heuristics and meta heuristics? Well, it's very easy to to understand the differences. Uh, the heuristics are methodologies or algorithms that are designed for a specific problem and they depend of the problem and the solutions that are depending on the problem. It, it means that they, if we have a heuristic designed for routing problems, it could not be modified to work in cancer detection, for example. <clears throat> It needs to, it, we need to define another heuristic that permits to work with cancer detection. In the case of meta heuristics, they are an upper level of heuristics and they could be easily adapted to solve different kind of problems. They are uh, not depending on the problem and in this way they are more flexible. This is why meta heuristics are more used, more used in the related literature than heuristics. And well, also, we have another uh, levels like hyper heuristics or learning heuristics or other methodologies, but meta heuristics are part are the base basis of all of them. So now we are going to discuss um, the steps that all meta heuristics share. Okay, because meta heuristics there are a lot of meta heuristics, but all of them have these um, 
steps that are present here in the in the image. So we have the initialization here that is a step where we are going to uh, distribute the solutions, the initial solutions. That this process is commonly performed randomly. It means that we have a, distribu a random distribution, and we are going to we're going to segregate different points along the search space. After that, we are going to evaluate all of these points in the objective function or being the function that this this point permits us to know the quality of the initialization point because they are they are now they now have a value that is related to the global or local optimal after that this next step is to update the positions of the, of the initialized population or in the, or initialized solutions here by using different operators that depend of the algorithm we are going to move or to compute different positions <coughs> in the search space and by creating a new population that is uh, updated the final step is to select between the updated population and the initial population the best solution according to the fitness function value. So we can, we know we have again a population that have only the best elements between the two populations. This um, three steps are repeated until a stop criteria is reached. It means that we here could define a um, a uh, number of iteration, a number of evaluation function, or different criteria that permit us to stop the algorithm and extract the best value. Okay, this is the methodology that MetaHeuristic follows, but also they have two intrinsic, two phases that are intrinsic in the update um, step. Okay, such phases are the exploration and the exploitation. Okay, here, we have that the exploration is related to analyze different position of the search space at the same time. And exploitation is in, um, requires that the solutions explore only a specific points that are prominent and has more probability to contain the optimal value. So in the next slide here, where we can see an example of exploration and exploitation. We have this, uh, this problem that is uh, very common in optimization. And this is the upper view of all these, uh, or a superior view of the surface. In this plot, we have the iterations, the, per the percentage of um, exploration and exploitation, and we could see how um, the exploration decrease along the iteration, but the exploitation increases during the iterations. And these points in the center, the letters that we have here, concern to each one of these um, plots, where we can see that at the beginning, we have more exploration than exploitation because all the particles or all the solutions that are all of those points are distributed <coughs> along the search space um, randomly. And when we going through the iterations, we could see how the exploitation uh, increases and the exploration decreases. And we could see how all the points are going together. This, this phenomenon occurs with different at uh, different stages of the optimization. We can see a letter E how we have more uh, particles together and less um, distribution. At the end of the iteration, like in letter G, we could see how these points are located in the optimal points that are these point in these points in the plot. So I'm going to mark it with uh, red. So we can see that here, here, and here 
are located all the solution that corresponds to this, this, and this point, because we're going, we're, in this problem, we are maximizing the solutions. So at the end, in the later age, all these points going together to the global optimal that is here, okay, that becomes to this part, okay? This is why exploration and exploitation is important. So this is a, this is very useful and is intrinsic in the metaheuristic algorithms. For that reason, I take the, some time to explain it. But how metaheuristic could be classified? Here we have a classification related to different point, different aspects. For example, we have the population-based approaches, the evolutionary algorithms, the, the direct direct approaches like simulated tunneling, implicit and explicit methodologies that are part, most of them, of the natural spirit um, class. Here we have also in the in this part the trajectory-based methods and the local search method and dyna dynamic uh, objective function methodologies. Also, we have some methods that has no memory because we can include memory to uh, save the position of the solutions. However, we have an, also another uh, important classification. Here we have five groups that define the some natural inspired approaches. We have evolutionary algorithms that include some methods like in genetic approaches. We have physical inspired al algorithms that includes the uh, simulated analytics, for, for example, there's worm based approaches that include the uh, particles worm optimization that is very common, the bio-inspired bio algorithms that include the uh, artificial immune system that are very popular, and the natural inspired algorithms that include methods like Cuckoo Search that, or Firefly. Okay, but between the Meta heuristic, we, we could also classify them in two big groups. The classical approaches that include the genetic, algorithm, differential evolution, particle optimization, among others, are the modern metaheuristics. Here, I consider some recent proposed methods, like this that was proposed this year. Um, this was proposed last year, the gaining shared knowledge algorithm. Um, this was proposed in 2019, and all of them are recently proposed, but we have a lot of methods that are recently proposed. Every month we could see a lot of um, new algorithms with different inspiration. But why? Why we have a lot of methods? Well, most of the researchers in this area considers the no free launch theorem as part of the inspiration to come, to have more art, more um, uh, more algorithms, because we could understand that from the no free launch theorem that no, we, it is it's impossible to have an universal approach or universal algorithm able to solve all the problems. In this way, the researchers in different uh, fields of the of science are looking for new methodologies, new algorithms that ha uh, have the capabilities to solve specific problems in the area of application. But also they are looking for hybrid methods that permit to uh, mix different operators to have more powerful methods or more powerful algorithms that could obtain more accurate solution for a specific problem. For that reason, we have uh, uh, this area is growing very fast, <clears throat> and we have a lot of algorithms published in different journals every day, every month, and every year. So let's see this in let's see an, an easy example of how um, meta heuristics could be used for a real problem. Here we have an example of image processing where we have an, an the original image, a uh, grayscale image, and the histogram of this image, that is the blue shape, okay? From the histogram, we can extract the objects that are contained in the image. 
here we have the cameraman, the sky and the field and some buildings in the back. Okay, by using um, the histogram, we can extract the, the person, the field and the, the sky and some buildings using thresholds that are these points in red. It means that the uh, dark pixels are in this class that I, I want to mark it. This is one class, this is another class, and this is another class. So the dark pixels correspond to the green pixels in the output. Um, the gray pixels that are not too, too light correspond to the other classification that could be the field and the sky is in the last classification. So we have this here, here, and here, okay? So we need to take this image and obtain this kind of results by using thresholding. But the problem is to find the optimal thresholds that permit us to generate the classes properly. To perform this task, we could use um, different objective functions here. We are use, using the auto function that is based on the between, between class variance. And by using this, we are going to identify a set of thresholds that are defined here by th th1, th2, th nt, and they conform a population of thresholds or a, a set of thresholds that are that could be used to obtain the segmented images. To include uh, meta heuristics in these kind of problems, we could follow this flow chart where we have a step where we are reading the image, then we are going to compute the histogram. They are going to generate to generate the initial population randomly in a search space that is defined in the gray level of pixels. After that, we could apply an inventoristic algorithm doing some small modification based on this problem formulation. And at the end of the metaheuristic, we could select the optimal set of thresholds and apply it to the image, the original image, to obtain this kind of output. In the problem formulation, we have the objective function, the population defined in this way, where we have sets of thresholds that have this configuration, and they are subject to this constraint. Oh, sorry, to this constraint, where the with L is this value that is the, that depend of the maximum amount of uh, level intensity level in the image. So by using this kind of um, methodology, we can include meta heuristic algorithms in the uh, in the process of uh, multi level thresholding. Well, after seeing <clears throat> this example, we could analyze. Uh, how meta heuristics uh, area is growing in the last years. Here we can see at the start uh, that we have uh, just few papers, but now we have this amount of papers published in Escopus. I took this information yesterday, so it is updated. And in this year, we have this amount of papers. And we are in the middle of the year, so we expect to have more than the last year published papers in this domain. But how they are distributed according to the areas of research? As we can see, we have that engineering and computer science are the areas where we have more uh, papers related to metaheuristics and applications. So we can understand that these areas are growing and we are related to all of them. So now let's going to see some applications here. I don't know if you can see this slide, but because it's very small, but here we, we can see some different areas of application of meta heuristics. Well, we have general application that uh, as neural networks, parallelization, uh, clustering, feature selection, <clears throat> image processing, multimodal optimization, etc. And we have some engineering applications here like control, quality control, <clears throat> infrastructure optimization, vehicle routing, um, robotics, and other different applications. 
in bio biological science, we have, the, uh, again, different applications, like in medicine, computational biology. We have also applications in social sciences, in, in industry, in management. It's very useful to optimize the production, the time, the time scheduling, and other different applications. In mathematics, again, we are taking these uh, algorithms to adapt them to solve some complex problems in mathematics, in natural science, for example, in, chemi in chemistry, and in her science, and in, of course, in computer, in computer sciences to uh, create some codes, to perform network methodologies, etc. Also, in finances, are very useful. Here in the next slides, we're going, I'm going to pass very fast. I put different uh, algorithms with different inspiration. We will take here um, any of them, like for example, um, <clears throat> the artificial bee colony algorithm that is based on the feeding of uh, bees or how they are danced to find for source of food. And we could see the, we can see here the areas of application. They are used in scheduling and estimation, transportation, energy, demand, in forecasting, um, the blast and produce ground vibration, and to solve problems like traveling salesman, in clustering, that is part of um, computer sciences. And there are different applications we can see in different domains, not only for a specific area. It means that this kind of methods could be adapted to different areas. So in the next slide, we have also different approaches. Mm, we can take this, um, for example, the bad algorithm that is very popular. And we could see that it's used in optimization, it means global optimization, classification, image processing, uh, in data mining for future selection, in scheduling, and well, again, in data mining for big data, for example to solve big data problems. In the next slide, we have another family of methods. Uh, we could take the cuckoo search or the cross edge search algorithm. Actually, I work with this method. And we could see that it's commonly used for engineering applications, feature selection, magnetic re resonance, image diagnosis. Uh, actually, I did this work. Uh, related to magnetic resonance, um, image segmentation of Parkinson's disease. I, it's one of my works. Uh, by the fine radial distribution networks to find different configuration in filter, in filters, in, in, in digital filters in engineering, and other approaches like electromagnetic optimization, economy, and emission dispatch in, in energy. So again, we could see that this kind of methods is are very useful in different areas of application. Uh, we have a, here another list of methods that also are applied in different areas. They are more noble, like um, we could take uh, the spot at the end optimizer that is, is racing, it's a recent algorithm that is used for future selection and different applications. Uh, well, let's see now another, the last, I think it's the last, yes, it's the last, um, the last list. And we have other kind of methods. Again, we could see different application, for example, this, that is um, applied for different uh, traveling problems, the, um, the multiple NAXAP problem, the scheduling problems, single demand uh, of um, unamed combat vehicles, this is to plan trajectories. So they are very used in different uh, fields. So these kind of methods are very interesting. And not only because we have uh, an inspiration regarding to some process, but also because the application of them is very easy and we can use to solve a lot of problems. Now, let's see the open challenges of these kind of methods. I divide the open challenge in two groups. The first one is for the design of methods. And the second one is for the application. In the design, we have that 
at the first point that we need to perform a convergence analysis and mathematical analysis to know why this method to understand sorry to understand why this method works from the mathematical point of view and why they converge to the optimal values this means that we need to prove that our method works from a mathematical point of view so this is an open challenge and researchers are working in this field we also have the point that is related to find a good balance with exploration and exploitation as we see in the slide related to exploration and exploitation we're looking for balance the degree of exploitation and exploration but until now it's not possible to find this balance because we are not able to identify when it occurs because it depends on the problem on the complexity of the problem but if uh, if we could find this balance we need to understand why occurs and if it doesn't it is not present in the in the problem we need also to try to find it so this is an also an optimization problem by itself also some researchers are looking for more intelligent approaches like those points that are self-adaptive and it means that such algorithms are able by itself to modify the intrinsical parameters to adapt to different problems and to the they could also automatically define until which point there could be modified and they could be iterated in an iterative process to find the new solutions. There are self-regulating algorithms and self-evolving algorithms. And finally, we have these three points that are related to hybrid approaches. When we are looking for new methods that include machine learning, uh, deep learning, we could mix meta heuristic with deep learning to find optimal um, configuration of the networks. We also have learn heuristics that when we combine uh, learning process from computer science with heuristics, and we have also sim heuristics that combine simulation, mathematical simulation with heuristics or meta heuristics to um, test our algorithms in the in a simulate in, in a simulation instead to test in the real problem. It is when the problems are very um, expensive, computationally speaking. It means that we have a, we, we require a lot of resources to run a, a problem. For example, if we are going to optimize a motor or, or a machine in a industry, we not run every time this process. So we take a simulation of this process and test our algorithm in this simulation instead to test in the real problem. So these are some um, uh, open challenges in in the area of design of algorithms, but we have also the application that includes multimodal problems, high dimensional problems, multi-objective problems, constrained optimization problems, and real problems. To see some of them, let's go to the next slide where we have multimodal problems. They are problems that include different optimal points but all of these points are good I mean, it means that are solutions of the problem so all of them are necessary to we need to create algorithms that are able to find all of these solutions at the same time in the same automatic problem the process so the algorithms must be able to explore the search space and find all of the solution not only the global so these kind of problems could be seen depending on the complexity as these plots where we have multiple points and the algorithms must be able to find all of them that here we can see a lot of maximal points and the algorithms need to identify all of them for a minimization problem we have this example where we have to find all of them all of these uh, small points so as you can see, these algorithms need to be more powerful because these are in two or three dimension, but it could be extended to multiple dimensions that is part of the multidimensional problems. So for the multi-objective problems, we have the definition of double two objective functions, two or more objective functions 
And here we need to find a set of solutions that conform the Pareto front. And we also need to find the optimal Pareto front. By doing this, we have a set of solutions that are nominated by uh, any of the objective functions. But the problem is not to find the Pareto. Well, the one problem is to find the Pareto, the optimal Pareto, but also another problem is to define which of these solutions is the best for our purposes, because all of them are good. One for the objective one, one for the objective two, but we need to find a balance between them. So this is also a area of research in metaheuristics that is very um, extensive in the research area. I mean, in the in the computer science area. So it's very interesting too to divide, to develop algorithms in that are able to solve multi-objective problems because most of the problems in engineering are related to to optimize two or more variables at the same time. For example, time and money are related in a process and we need to identify the balance between them by optimizing different uh, functions. Uh, in real problems, we have problems of the sign. Most of them are, are related to the sign different uh, artifacts. Like here, we are, we, I, this is an example of uh, the design of a wine turbine. And here we have the design with in the conventional methods with by using a lot of variables. And here we have the definition by using uh, an optimization algorithm, a meta heuristic. When we could see that it's less difficult, we have less variables to optimize. And it did help to prove if our com um, comp uh, computation are good or not. Also, here we have the problem with different constraints. For example, for the design of um, preserved vessels, where we have the objective function that is um, the minimization of these values subject to all of these constraints. So constraints are very common. Um, are necess the algorithms that we are going to assign need to be able to handle with all of the constraints. Here we have four, but in real pro problems, we have a lot of constraints that we need to handle in, in order to obtain accurate values. Well, this is all from my side. Uh, now I'm going to read your questions. If you have some questions, I'm going to read them. So, I need to see how to move to the chat. So, so let's see uh, the questions. Please, uh huh. So I have one question. Just. Uh, Anna, how can, I, how okay. can I move to the chat? Okay, I see. Oh. Okay. Okay, I want to read the question of Tatiana. That uh, what else are you? No, no. I'm sorry. Uh, the okay. question from Alexey Matviev, the last, uh, the last one. The, uh, do you see it? Inspired to yes. learn mm -hmm. meta heuristic algorithm. What are the best okay. resources to start with? Yes. Well, we have a um, in uh, in this community of meta heuristic. We have a uh, a lot of. Um, sources where you can find information. I recommend you to go to see some videos, especially related to particle swarm optimization. I can write the name of the... particle swarm optimization, genetic algorithms. And differential evolution. You could find a lot of information related to those uh, algorithms in there in Google. And you can start with 
this um, free algorithms to understand how all the methods work. They are the basic approaches. So you can understand them. You can see some videos. You can download some code from uh, MathWorld for MATLAB. You can find code on Python. And you can interact with this, um, uh, with this algorithm and define your own problems. You can also, when you start searching for information, you could see different mathematical functions that you could optimize and you could test. Also, I recommend you to read some uh, conferences, the paper from conference like, um, like Gecko or CC, that are two conferences that have related uh, this kind of methods. Uh, I don't know if you have any other question. Mm -hmm. Let me check. <clears throat> uh -huh. Alexey Matviev uh, said, thank you. <laughs> For your answer, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. Mm. So now I don't see any questions. Okay, good. So thank you very much for your uh, thank you very interesting lecture. Thank you for being with us from Mexico. <laughs> no worries. It's fine. It, yes, <laughs> now it is possible. <laughs> Mexico. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for um, giving this opportunity. Continue enjoying the summer school on the week. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, 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 no questions. Um, so thank you and this was uh, the last lecture for today and I would like to thank all attendees uh, and um, see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we have three lectures too but uh, at more uh, at earlier time. Please check our uh, time pad and please uh, check uh, emails and uh, telegram chat. I will send all the information and uh, the new link to the third, uh, to the fourth day of our international school. So thank you very much, and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye.